Hello everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us here at Gertrude Glasshouse this afternoon. I'm so thrilled to be in conversation with Scotty So. Uh, but before we get into the conversation, I thought I'd take a moment to acknowledge that we are meeting on unceded uh, Wurundjeri land. And I'd like to pay my respect to elders past and present and also extend a really warm welcome to any First Nations people uh, in the room with us today. So where to begin with Scotty So? Uh, Scotty So is a NAM Melbourne-based artist working across a range of media, including photography, painting, sculpture, site responsive installation, video, and drag performance. His work has been shown in Australia, Hong Kong, China, and the UK, where he recently exhibited at the 2023 Photo London Fair at Somerset House. Scotty is represented by Mars Gallery in Windsor and is a current Gertrude studio artist. So thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. I thought that we would start um, this conversation by talking about some of the overarching themes um, underpinning this exhibition. So it's called Developing Sunset, a play on Selling Sunset, the Netflix TV show. Um, and it's all about personal identity in relationship to the home, or at least the concept of the home. How did you begin thinking about this concept um, and how does it relate to your practice at large? Well, growing up in Hong Kong, um, real estate agent is a big thing there. Property developers is considered as one of the biggest industry in Hong Kong. And it was very famous for us to live in really tiny, tiny apartment and in shoe boxes, paying extremely expensive rent. And so moving here in 2018, I thought that, oh, wow, you can actually see the sky. You walk on the street, there's no buildings around you. And it's kind of scary. Because um, I moved here to a suburban area in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. And all this green, all this grass and all the sky. And so that kind of gave me the idea of that Australian dream of you know living in the suburban area. And especially with the context of place like Moven, where it's considered as a lot of, um, middle, I'd say middle class, is it middle class there? Yeah, up, yeah, I would say upper middle class, upper yeah. Middle class. yeah. But um, I've been house sitting for a friend for five years there. <laughs> so it's kind of like also the experience of not renting, but kind of being a space that I know is not mine, but I get to do a lot of my own stuff there. And so I started thinking about the home, the idea of home, and walking around, seeing all these real estate agents, billboards, um, kind of made me wonder what's that connection they all have in between different agency and yeah. places of home. Yes, it's interesting because Hong Kong is one of the most densely populated cities in the world, and property is hard and few to come by. And in Australia, it's hard to acquire property but it still seems much more attainable and so something that I think really comes across a lot of your works is this idea of desire and aspiration in this in this exhibition the question of desire does that was that a big overarching narrative as well in well, this exhibition definitely I think that um, the more I grow into my adulthood I realized that the desire is unlimited mm. that you want something and you chase for it then when you get there, you're fulfilled and you just want to chase for the next things. And so I see that with properties, I see that with even just career or dreams or loved ones, and you try to chase for something, but it never really, there's never an end to it. And so I kind of see that in this billboard that's sort of selling the desire, the kind of visual language they use in the images they have taken for real estate um, billboards. Mm. There's a certain tone of sky, a certain kind of environment they created in these images they take for the billboards and the grass. There's always a grass, there's always the blue sky. And so I see there's that kind of connection with all these billboards, and that kind of gave me the entry point to this collection of work. Yeah, I think one of the works in this um, exhibition that I really love and I come back to is seven photos of my home in Glen Iris from different real estate companies. And I love the way that you've overlaid different photographic, um, yeah, different photographs from real estate companies and 
the more that you lay them on top of each other, the more the image of the house becomes obscured. I was wondering if you could talk about yeah, that specific work. Um, so I have been living there for five years, as I said, and over these five years, there has been, I think, four of the apartments in the complex has been sold to someone else. Um, and there has been many auctions and my neighbors changing over time. And so one, start, one day I decided to look up my um, address on Google and see what would come up. And then I see all these images of my apartment being taken by different real estate agents. And they all look very similar. They all have my... So I live on the top floor, the second floor, mm. first floor in Australia. Yes. Ground, uh, ground floor. Ground floor. First, first floor. floor, yeah. Um, and I have a balcony facing the street. So when the, the, these real estate agents, they take the pictures, they always take it from the front mm -hmm. and my apartment's always in it. But the thing is my apartment feels like messy. Mm. And so you could take, you could see my apartment from the street. And so when they take it, they actually Photoshop my apartment mm -hmm. out, like all every, they, whiten my apartment and turn it into like you can't see what's inside just so they can sell the other apartments because they don't want people to know they have a messy neighbor mm -hmm. um, and I see that there's this sort of familiar, familiarity of all these images from the angle from you know the wide lens so I, re I thought oh what if I just layer them all with my apartment where they all meet where all, I layer where my apartment is on top of all these images on you know Photoshop I just to see how it looks and I realized oh I can just do it in real life printing them all on the thin mm. kind of material and just do it in real life layering them then you would create this really blurry image but where it is my apartment you will see the most clear mm. and so it's kind of like exposing my home into the public as well but without my actual apartment because it's been photoshopped out. Mm. Um, so that was kind of like a fair relate, a, a dream, I guess, that is related to my home a lot. Mm. But it's also very separated from the real home. Yeah. When you moved to Melbourne, were you struck by the way that the, the way that we engage with property just culturally? Was it something that you, was it something that surprised you? I think when I moved here, I wasn't so shocked because I guess I was shocked when people were telling me how much they pay, how expensive they pay. I'm like, that's nothing. Yeah. I like my neighbors, um, the apartment across mine actually has been selling for a month now and today is the last day to buy it. So if anyone want to buy it, they can buy it. <laughs> yeah. But that one's the asking price, $580,000. Mm -hmm. And for like two bedroom apartment with balcony, it's actually a, like compared to what you would get in Hong Kong, that's nothing. Like you can, you have to pay maybe at least a million dollar for that. Yeah. Um, and so I was surprised when I come here, knowing everyone's been complaining about the rent, but like mm, actually, it's not that it's not that bad. Mm. But it, it's more the kind of lifestyle of having house party all the time, having like backyard, having the kind of very casual Melbourneian life mm. is something that um, I find really interesting. That's sort of like my friend would host dinner in his um, truck house, share house, and I would go over there and we'd, you know, we'd have a good time and I would take the tram home. In Hong Kong, we'd never do something like that. Yeah, it's definitely, um, it kind of ties into that pace that people see when they first walk into the space, which is called Bell Prosperity, um, which is, yeah, a play on Bell Real Estate. And I think that painting, um, in a, and it, it's a really clever play on words, but it's this idea that to have a happy and beautiful life is to own property and it's attached to property. That's something that feels quite unique to Australia and, um, and to the US. Would you agree with yeah, that? Yeah, definitely. yeah. But I think also the type of property is that here people dream of is more a house yeah. and the land. Yeah. And I think the difference is that in Hong Kong is more like apartments. Yes. Like, which is why I think it gives me a different angle to look into this work. Yeah. 
um, like for example, the the guy that is on the right, mm -hmm. the three paintings of um, Steve Beck, who's the principal of Bell Poverty. He actually this image. He I walked past it for five years now because he has his picture at the Bell Properties um, in Glen Arms, which is next to a tram stop. And it just really struck me when I saw that because I thought that's so much confidence in this man and this this white man, middle class or upper class, and just in a suit with a tie that is the same color of Bell um, Bell Property, and having his hands in a pocket. I just thought I really want to create something using his image mm. um, without asking his permission. <laughs> Because if you, if you put that image out in public, I think you're basically inviting people to engage with it. And so I chose to engage with him in this way mm. and then creating these paintings that have... Um, I saw different pictures from different TV shows, Kath and, Kim, um, Kath and Kim, Neighbors and Place Like Me, and all these images were taken by different property developers. Um, for the, because they were selling this property as well. Yeah. Um, as we all know, Kath and Kim's house no, is no longer there, but the picture I got was when they were selling that, pic that piece of land and properties. Mm. Um, and so I thought it would be funny to put him in front of these houses yeah. and create this sort of graffiti on top of him to kind of like make him less intimidating or more approachable. Yeah, but what's interesting is that you've changed his appearance depending on which house he's standing yeah. in front of. And for me, the way that I read that is this idea that real estate agents can change their guys depending on what they want to sell to you. Mm -hmm. um, it's a dream that they're selling to a person specifically and they can really change the message depending on what they're trying to, what, what they, who they think that they're talking to, what they think that they value. And I think like that's very much related to sometimes to the art industry too. Yeah. That you know, gallerists or creators or artists themselves even, you know, constantly changing of the narrative of our narrative as well. That mm. so you know, it's not that whatever suits them we can sell the work, but yeah, I feel we as art industry had is quite similar to their industry as well. Yeah, it's this idea of yeah, narratives being really pliable and you can kind of take, we're given subject matter, but what you do with that is completely up to the person mm. who is holding all of that information. Um, I wanted to talk about the signs in the middle. Um, we've got this warning sign and also the, um, the stop sign over there. How does that relate to the paintings? Well, I see these, so there's, an, an, there's also one more in the bathroom outside, outside of the bathroom where it says um, stop, no, slow down and dance with me, yes, slow, which is by a very great musician of Australia. <laughs> How do you know? Um, so I see all these signs, of course they, own the, they contain the meaning of being um, the masculinity of tradies, a sort of you see them all really dirty sign on this road because that's always either they're fixing the road or fixing some other things or they will have um, a construction site building something and to me I see that construction as a way there's a durational period of that that would just exist for a period of time and then they're gone and I find them really interesting and because you see them all the time mm. as well, and they have this certain, certain format. They have to be visible, they have to use a certain material to create that reflection. And a lot of them is to tell people to slow down or to stop. And I relate that with different songs by different great musicians as well. Um, like the slow sign, the slow and the stop with the lollipop. One day I just thought about that and realized that they is, is exactly the same meaning of the very famous women's group of um, the UK, Spice Girls. Spice Girls, yes. <laughs> Spice's woman. Um, <laughs> and it just happened to be in my mind, oh, this is literally something I could create and got a manufacturer for the site 
and created this using industrial graded material. Then I thought if they're gonna be spinning this, especially this one, if it's gonna spin, I might as well put it on the platform and create it like a crystal ball to link that to the kind of camp gayness. Hmm. I'm just kind of querying this objects that is so masculine. Mm. Um, and with this sign in the middle, it's more like a warning sign to myself because I've been, I've got a lot of friends who tell me that, you know, you have to slow down and consider what you've done in your years so far. But I often think that, oh, Scotty, you're not doing much enough. Why are you not still in certain institution? Because um, I always want to keep going. I feel like I'm still young still need to, you know, go for it. And then I realized that I could create this sign for myself and just tell myself to slow down. But then it's still relate to um, the TLC mm. girl group um, whose left eye is, you know, no longer with us. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And I, and I think also just the, the idea of a construction sign as well really does relate to what you were saying before about how in Hong Kong people live in apartments and in Australia the thing that makes our properties unique is that is a sense of space mm. and this idea that we take up space and that's tied to our relationship with ourselves but also our relationship with our neighbours and our friends. Um, yeah, so I, yeah. And so I see that kind of like telling all of us as well to, you know, slow down and because this one is all about don't go chasing waterfall. You may think, you know, that song is either beautiful or like a very unique, a very iconic song, but the lyrics itself is really telling someone to don't go chasing waterfall and, you know, be in your pond, be in your river, but you got to take it slow and enjoy the moment. That's how I see those lyrics. Yeah. And I realized that, you know, this all this sign is related to. The language of dreams. And so in the end, I realized then how, because I thought I had a worry about, oh, maybe they're not going to relate with the painting as well. But I think this representing the process mm. of what these are and what this would be. And so I wanted to um, include them into the show as well. Yeah. Well, I think this whole show is about, yeah, the language of real estate advertisements. And I think the signs puts it into actual words um, in one way or another. For those who are familiar with Scotty's work, um, I think it would be fair to say that most people know you through your photographs and your ceramics and performance. And so it was really exciting to see this exhibition of paintings um, because there is a conceptual practice that underpins your wider practice at large. What is it about painting that it was appealing for you to yeah to explore real estate and dreams why did you choose to go with painting as opposed to photography i think in this show i really look into the quality that painting has for um, representational art um, a lot of the paintings i've seen nowadays are people painting really beautiful objects or birds or um, landscape or um, beautiful fruit basket and you know they all this kind of representation representational objects and mm -hmm. paintings and i wanted to use that as a way to ma manipulate the images of billboards and real estate images um, but then creating these sort of they are not hyper real estate but they are still representational and i really like that quality of it i think the, the quality of all painting elevates the concept, because paintings are always considered as something um, fancy or posh, or like you collect paintings and you're a serious art um, collector. Mm. And often you, when you're in a beautiful home, you have beautiful painting, unique paintings there. And so I just thought that it would be interesting to bring that into the, bring the sign of real estate billboard back into paintings. Especially with that work with the um, the Buxton billboard, mm. since we know that Michael Buxton and the Buxton family donated the um, Buxton Contemporary to Unimel, and 
I would just think that it would be interesting to turn Buxton Contemporary into an artwork itself. But then also putting that back into the Buxton real estate, turning it into a billboard. Mm. But then through the, the whole thing was actually painted and turned into a format of a billboard right now with the lighting and the grass and the stand. But the whole thing was painted and I just thought it would be so funny to do that. Yeah, it seems like you're attracted to portraying things quite literally. Because I think that if you were to go with conceptual art, it needed that um, fineness, that, that sort of technique or, also, or the medium has to speak to that concept. And I think painting was the one that gave it. Because if I were to just create another billboard, it would be considered as too fast to create something so easy to be made. Mm. But um, I, that's why I thought painting was, you know, the traditional art. Yeah. But then with very stupid concept. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I got people asking me about why are you changing your practice or why is these things not exactly what you've been doing? But to me, I think I've been having this um, conceptual practice for years and that's how I started my when I was at uni. Um, it's just that the drag and the performance it was later on really grasped by the public. Um, but this show I get I realized that I can really put whatever I want to put into it. So I decided to I've always wanted to create this show of just properties to fill the pain. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think it's still related to my practice about parafiction. Everything I've done so far with my works is always about there's something true in my work, but there's the off in it too. Like there's something different, there's something strange when you look at it, even though you understand the language of what I'm presenting, you've seen these images before, but there's something odd. Mm. And I think that's the oddness is what I want to create. And that relates to this work, relates to drag, it was related to images manipulation. Um, and so I think... Yeah, and it's just related to this idea of sincerity and mm. insincerity, I think, is something that also mm. waves uh, throughout your entire practice. Yeah, and pop culture as well. And there is a love culture. of pop culture. We, you often talk about being driven by, you say, the thrill of camp. What, do you, what, does, what does that mean to you? I think it's that moment when you're like, go full on stupidity. <laughs> and I always say that my work is stupid, but I don't mean it in a way that is devaluing the work. I mean it in a way that is, why, like, why? Like, why wouldn't you paint something beautiful and so easily accepted by the general public? But instead you painted this guy. Like, that's something I... It's that thrill of Cam that... That is so Cam to paint him like that. And that's sort of the... You know, you laugh at it, but then it's not like a laugh that like, haha, that is so funny, it's so humorous. But it's more like the concept of you putting so much seriousness to create this painting. Yeah. And I think that's the part where the thrill of camp is from. Mm. You know, have sending the sending the design to the factory, saying that hey, I want this done, and then they had to make this for me. Um, something that is so it's Spice Girls lyrics. Mm. Yeah. Um, and so that's where the camp I think is from this sort of seriousness to really create something so stupid. <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. I want to talk about uh, the hospitality work just in the corner there in that room. It, you call it a self-portrait and I think that's so clever because it's really, it really subverts the genre of <laughs> portraiture because if you look at it, it's, the figure in the painting is hardly visible at all. What was the... What was, yeah, can you just speak on, I suppose, this work at large? For me, the way that I read it is this idea of getting lost in a dream and you become obscured in, in the face of what is being sold to you. But so when I... There was one day I was working past Bunsrick during lockdown period, actually. 
And I saw this、um, showroom was selling this apartment, and then it says hospitality, literally on the on the glass. And I just thought that's so stupid. <laughs> it's, but the font is so、um, designed. It was so. What's the word for it? Very.、Um, Alluring, purposeful, purposeful, yeah.、Um, and I just thought, like, because they created this landscape of garden in the showroom, but then you also have this side of the of the space.、Mm. And then I looked into it and then I thought, oh, I can see these, but in the same time, I'm seeing the、um, the sky, the background of where I am from the reflection. And then there's in between this this test of hospitality, and so. I, Started with I started to think about oh what is this sort of meaning behind all of this like if it is if it if the garden setup is the real bit is the is it the reflection that is the real or is it the meaning of hospitality in between that is the real in this whole experience、um, and so I took a picture of it、um, of myself in front of the Showroom, and I sent that to a factory in China that produces paintings for people.、Um, a workshop, so I had them painted that, and they arrived because, but then it wasn't painted really nicely because they didn't know what it was. They saw, they don't understand the meaning of it. Why am I asking them to paint this weird thing? They didn't even know there was reflection of mirror as well. So when it arrived, I had to put back the details of the cars being the reflection,、um, putting little details to turn it into a more realistic of reflection kind of painting.、Um, but then I think the most important bit of this work is that Tracy from Gertrude、um, Contemporary, who is one of the director of Gertrude. Um, actually, bought her apartment from there, <laughs> and without us even knowing about it, like I have that painting hanging in my studio, and one day I asked her to have a look at it and let me know, asking her for feedback, and turns out she was like, "Is that in Brunswick?" <laughs>、um, and I think that was such a beautiful touch to this work, because again, like you know, we talk about this dream of property's property's ownership. Someone, you know. It can be someone can have all these properties, but or someone could never dream of having one. But then it was so close to me that someone actually owns one, and then it was she owns that one, <laughs> and that's something I guess. To me, I think it was the most personal work in here. It's such an indictment on the nature of <laughs> property in Australia that it's amazing to know someone who owns a property. <laughs> and,、uh, If you look carefully, you can even see my scooter there. Yeah, yeah. I haven't even noticed the scooter. That's a great. I didn't know that about that work. <laughs> I didn't know that Tracy bought her apartment from <laughs> that. But that's why I named the title.、Um, that makes so much <laughs> more the sense. The title is. Wait. Self portrait in front of the window of the showroom where Tracy will be getting her apartment from. <laughs> <laughs> Very literal. Again, it goes into that this thing where I do feel like you, the way that you express your concepts, you express them in a way that's extremely literal. Even the way it goes into the way that you title your works. It's very representational.、Too. Very representational. So that's and that is the type of art it seems that、I、you think, are interested yeah, in exploring. But in a way that I want to, rep- I want to manipulate them. Manipulate them. I want to make them. They all referenced on something else, and so, and which I think is always in my practice as well. That I love referencing.、Mm. I love the little details of. It can't just be in a like he can't just be in a random landscape or in front of a random house. It has to have that. Why I choose these images as the reference,、mm. um, and I think that's why that works. Like. With Tracy buying it, adding even more story and adding more references to it. Yeah, it's um, yeah, it's it's a great work, and the the work that I find re- that I wasn't able to write about in the essay because there just wasn't enough space. But the um, 
the Matthew Selling 45 Lawrence Avenue Airport West 100 years later 2023 that work over there is really interesting it's really funny because the words overlaid I mean can you explain kind of what the sentence that you've overlaid the, the work with. The house was actually, they sold this house. So Matthews is a developing company, uh, real estate agent as well. They sold that house and I found that on their website. They are the ones that create lots of large, huge, black billboard in front of many houses yeah. as their way of advertising. And it's so obnoxious. Yeah. It's very, you see it a lot of places. Um, one of them that I walked past was that um, it says a landmark period of home deserves a big billboard in front of it, so here it is. Mm. And I thought, wouldn't it be funny if this, work, this, this house that they have, they have sold, which is such an ugly house from, from our standard. It's probably built in 2000, I think. Um, but then it has no characteristic, it's so boring. And even the picture they took, it looked really beautiful actually on the picture. But even the, the sky is not grey, uh, the sky is not blue, everything is like very concrete colour and then a touch of green there. But I thought about it being, what if they, this house is being sold again in 100 years later? It would be a period at home. Yeah. <laughs> that's, I, that's what I find so funny. It's, the, it's using the word period home to describe just, just this... I don't even, yeah, this house that you see in every residential area is hilarious because it's true and that is, that would be what would happen a hundred years like, from now. A lot of people, you know, saying how they find the Victorian home so beautiful, the um, Art Deco apartment, all of that period home so beautiful, but then what if back in a hundred years ago they were just, everyone, oh I hate this, I wish I was living in a Edwardian or like, Oh, I wish I was living in a Rococo, but I guess like it wasn't. Yeah. The British one. The British one period. <laughs> yeah, it's um. What what would what's a period home in Hong Kong? What would be? We don't have one. Yeah. We, I guess like the live. There's a few that's still alive, that's still around, but then they would be so expensive, and mm. they would, those were built in um, the colonization time, when British Hong Kong was British Hong Kong. Mm. And then most people live in really new housing, um, really new apartments. There are also buildings from the 60s, which are the kind of typical housing in sci-fi movie that portray Hong Kong as the like, like Kowloon Wall City, or like, you know, when you watch um, Ghost in the Shell, or Blade Runner, that kind of neon light. Yeah. So people do live in those buildings, mm. which is very interesting. Yeah. Um, I want to talk again quick because I know we touched on it just then but the question of media I think you as I was saying before you're someone who kind of explores every single form of uh, medium that you can and you don't feel the need to work within one specific area do you think you ever will tie yourself down to working primarily through in one medium I or? don't think so I think I guess first of all I would get really bored of doing that yeah. and then I also think that medium is more to me is a tool yeah it contain a different medium contain different um, conceptual meaning behind and if I were if I were to use Photoshop for this one this whole work would have been different mm. it would be read differently and so to me I like to understand how to create these so different mediums as well being curious of learning new technology or new medium as well. Um, and with that skills or with those tools, I can then apply different tools into my ideas that I have for certain things. Mm. And, you know, I wouldn't just, I also wouldn't um, stop from, oh, let me continue exploring about real estate agent. I feel like it's more about still living my life and I can continue expanding this collection or get deeper with this collection, but I don't think I have the need of like, oh, I need to get it done now. Yeah. Um, because to me, it's a slow game and I have to take it slow. You, you gotta stop right now and slow it down. <laughs> um, is there, yeah, for what's the next, um, what's the next project that you're 
working on if you can um, the I next area that because you said you're not going to do real estate you're not well, going to got uh, I got spring affair to do and then um, a show a solo show in Hong Kong which I'll be showing a, a few new ceramic work and a bunch of photographs as well as video work and then um, I got a photography project coming up as well for next year mm -hmm. and then also got this installation solo show in Sydney um, at the end of this year and then Oh, next Thursday I'm having an exhibition here too, upstairs. Oh, um, amazing! Yeah. Together, open together with um, Mia Bo's exhibition. Yep. After at um, Gershi Glasshouse as well. So welcome to join yeah. us. Cool. Um, yeah. Does anyone have any questions for Scotty? <laughs> Are you, in the work, do you feel like you are mocking it? Or is there a part of you also that is like, oh, I'm kind of coming around to why Australians have this attitude? I guess it's not about mocking or criticising of anything at all. I think it's, to me, it's more about reflecting it mm -hmm. as someone who is observing it as, as well as being part of it. Um, of course, I want to own properties. I want to be a landlord, but <laughs> I'll be a good landlord. <laughs> but um, like in in the end of the day, it is still a business. You know, it's still a you know whoever has owned these properties, then they can continue running the money, and it's all about you know you invest into more properties. And I heard about someone telling me that there's a saying. When you don't have the property, you would um, always fight for lower rent, lower prices for housing. But once you cross that line, once you own something, you stand on the side of the line. You want to give up your, um, what's that word? Um, why? A privilege. You want to give up your privilege. <laughs> um, because, because when you own it, you, it's your, is your um, properties now, mm. and, you know, you don't want it to develop. And so to me, when I have it, I have a different way of thinking it. I would, you know, right now I want so to you have you it. See yourself I want to, I think like that. <laughs> but that's also something that um, I'm sure everyone wants to as well. And it's not something an evil thing to do, to own something. It's all our desire. Mm. It's, um, it's, yeah, because I, when I first saw these works, I thought that you were taking, it was very much satirizing the industry and you were looking at it from the perspective of someone who's mocking it almost, but then it was really the, the self-portrait in front of the, um, in front of the apartment where Tracy will be getting her, um, yeah, her apartment from that. I realized that it's a little bit more, you, where you stand, with in relation to our industry is it's a little bit more nuanced it's mm. it's recognizing that it is a legitimate industry and it it gives a lot of people a sense of purpose or something to work towards mm. and it's desire at the end of the day which is fascinating yeah any other questions Has it really said that <laughs> no. <laughs> um, people ask me a lot if I ever would let him know or, I mean I've one of my work that I have done before um, for a grass show at VCA, I did a billboard of, uh, not billboard, I did a replication of the tax agent window front on Smith Street. And people always ask me, oh, have you ever let him know? I said, no. I don't think they need to know that about it. I don't think they need to know I am the one who made that. The tax person, he knows about that work. Um, and he's very okay with it, he loves it. With him, I don't mind if he knows, I don't mind if he doesn't know. I think it's more, I see him as a symbol rather than he is someone that I want to have a conversation or like a deep connection with. But he's more like a symbol that I see he represents, that's why he's his male, middle class, probably straight. Um, but it's that sort of, the, the, it's more the energy that why and also he was out in public on the street with the with this picture 
largely printed, and so. You might have a good deal on that house. I'm sure I know someone else who will give me a good deal as well. <laughs> <laughs> but right now I'm not paying rent. I've been house sitting. <laughs> 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 oh, I have a question. If you were to buy right now, where, how much, and what kind of yummy money would you be? Richmond. Richmond? I would do Richmond. I think it's sitting, be oh, but not like Richmond closer to um, the train station, though. <laughs> <laughs> I think like Richmond next to the river. Mm. Would it still be Richmond? Cremorne. Cre yeah, Cremorne. Yeah, Cremorne is a yeah. good area. Not next to the highway, though. Yeah. But like a factory turning into an apartment, I think those could be quite nice to live in. Very modern, very beautiful. Um, I, I've got told to buy houses instead of apartment, but I think, I think housing, unless it's like a very beautifully built modern house, it doesn't have to be new, but it has, I like the modern look of it. I can't do Victorian or just don't think they look pretty. And how much? I, um, I don't have a budget. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yes, Carl. Um, this is something that you at me in the whole talk, and also when I was like, thinking about this exhibition, you're finishing the new one again. Um, this was very pretty complicated and body question, and I don't really have my ideas of what's about to result either. But I know that with um, your sign work, and like, your very first show that I saw at George Patton Gallery, <laughs> all your signs and the um, text um, sign, they were all produced by factories in Hong Kong and China. And so with this show, when I saw that it was painting, I was very intrigued and I was confused as to had, if you had you produced them or you had... But then I think at one point you mentioned during the talk that this was produced by a factory in China. These five were... Produced. And then those two, the one in the, by the desk and this one, I painted it myself. Yeah, I think um, so my question was more thinking around, I guess, implica in the implications in your thematic of um, like property development and this desire, this aspirational desire to work towards um, a property ownership, so much as I was tied into like class and uh, labour and work and how we are all enmeshed in this like class structure when you're working towards this dream that you're not able to attain. But then in the creation of your works, do you consider the perhaps ethics? of um, in creating other workers and labourers in the work, but they're not fully explicating on their um, part in it. Like they're, because I haven't read too much about the people that you've um, brought on to paint things in like text around this show. I think it's a very interesting question. I got asked by some student when I gave them an artist talk the other day. And I think to me, it's having them painting it it's similar to me having a, when I create photographs, self portrait, having someone to click the button for me, or having someone to um, even to produce this side. You know, I can't be the one that constantly making every single thing. And of course, if there are artists who like beautiful painters who make beautiful paintings and they can do really beautiful skills. But to me, it's more about the the image that is done as in a painting form, so they have this um, workshop in this village in Shenzhen that is very famous for creating souvenir art or creating paintings for um, artists and I don't see that the need of having them so much into the composition of this work but it's more about the final products I know so to some people it may be a bit too, like the moral standard is not as right, but in the end of the day I pay them as what they ask for. Um, I never try to like ask for a lower price. If they give me a price that I'm happy with, then I'll go for it. And which we, that's the transaction we had. Um, and in the end of the day, it's more about the concept that's important to me rather than who painted it. I would like to have painted these as well, but I didn't wanting. I didn't have the will to really do that. I had the will to make the Bell of Prosperity and the Buxton one because I think they those are more I could handle. Um, but 
I still see these paintings at the same value, whether, I, whether it be painted by me or not. I don't think I'm a good painter. Um, if someone's going to paint it better, and that would allow the idea to go through stronger, and that's what I think it's okay for me to hire someone to create this work. And some people ask, some student asked me if I should have credited the person who painted. Um, to me, it's like, again, it's like the labor of um, manufacture. It's more, if I were to collaborate with some painter, then of course this would have been credited. And I have worked with people with um, collaboration works and I would always credit them. But they're, they're, that kind of collaboration is more, they would bring in their idea as well, they would bring in their um, concept into the work. But these, it was more like, I give them this instruction and the image of the design of what I want and they created it. So it's similar to the manufacturer that created this road sign. And so I don't see the need of having them to the credit. But I would, of course, if someone asked me, I would always say that I didn't paint them, but I did add the little touch to them. All good, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Scotty. This was a pleasure. Um, and <laughs> congratulations on this show. It's, um, yeah, it's really fun and interesting and also thought-provoking. So thank you. Thank you.